Good evening. Please leave the light on. For the last time, tonight's vigil is kept in the luxurious Parisian apartment of Théophile Gautier, the hookah-smoking, cat-loving prince of bohemians. What inspired his fantasy? Why should it be so disordered, so immoral, so vivid? Perhaps it is better not to know. From my earliest childhood, I had felt a vocation to the priesthood, so that all my studies were directed with that idea in view, and my superiors judged me worthy, despite my youth, to pass the last awful degree. My ordination was fixed for Easter week. I had never gone into the world. I regretted nothing. At last, the great day came. The bishop, a venerable old man, seemed to me God the Father leaning over his eternity. During the holy sacrifice, I accidentally lifted my head, which until then I had kept down, and beheld before me, on the further side of the sanctuary railing, a young woman of extraordinary beauty. I lowered my eyelids, firmly resolved not to again open them. In another minute, nevertheless, I reopened my eyes. Oh! How beautiful she was. And gazing, I felt opening within me gates that had until then remained closed. Life suddenly made itself visible to me under a totally novel aspect. A frightful anguish commenced to torture my heart. Meanwhile, the ceremony was proceeding, and I shortly found myself transported far from that world of which my newly born desires were furiously besieging the entrance. I answered yes when I wished to say no. All was consummated. I had become a priest. As I was about to cross the threshold of the cathedral, a hand suddenly caught mine, a woman's hand. It was cold as a serpent's skin, and yet its impress remained upon my wrist, burnt there as though branded by a glowing iron. It was she. Unhappy man. What hast thou done? she exclaimed in a low voice and immediately disappeared in the crowd. I blushed and turned pale. A companion took pity on me. He seized my arm and led me back to the seminary. At the corner of a street, while the young priest's attention was momentarily turned in another direction, a negro page, fantastically garbed, approached me and slipped into my hand a little pocket book with gold embroidered corners. I concealed it in my sleeve, and there kept it until I found myself alone in my cell. There were only two leaves within, bearing the words, Claremond, at the Concini Palace. I felt life rising within me like a subterranean lake, expanding and overflowing. My blood leapt fiercely through my arteries. My long, restrained youth suddenly burst into active being. I flung myself on my bed, my heart filled with frightful hate and jealousy, and gnawed my fingers and my bed covers like a tiger that has passed ten days without food. I know not how long I remained in this condition, but at last I suddenly perceived the Abbe Serapion, who was standing watching me attentively. I came, he said, to tell you that you have been appointed to your curacy. Be ready, therefore, to start tomorrow. As soon as my installation was over, the Abbe Serapion returned to the seminary. I was, therefore, left alone, with no one but myself to look to for aid or counsel. For a whole year I lived thus, filling all the duties of my calling with the most scrupulous exactitude, praying and fasting. But I felt a great aridness within me, and the sources of grace seemed closed against me. One night, my doorbell was long and violently rung. A man, richly clad in a foreign costume, told me that his mistress, a very noble lady, was lying at the point of death and desired to see a priest. Two horses, black as the night, stood without the gate, pawing the ground. We devoured the road. At last, the whirlwind race ceased. 
The hoofs of our horses echoed upon a strong wooden drawbridge, and we rode under a great vaulted archway, which darkly yawned between two enormous towers. The major domo advanced to meet me. Too late, he cried. Too late, sir priest. But if you have not been able to save the soul, come at least to watch by the poor body. He took my arm and conducted me to the death chamber. I knelt down and commenced to repeat the psalms for the dead. My eyes fell upon the bed. She was covered with a linen wrapping of dazzling whiteness, which was of so fine a texture that it concealed nothing of her body's charming form. Wild fancies came thronging to my brain. I thought to myself that she might not, perhaps, be really dead, that she might only have feigned death for the purpose of bringing me to her castle and then declaring her love. I bent over her and grasped the corner of the sheet. I lifted it back. There, indeed, lay Claremont. The more I gazed, the less could I persuade myself that life had really abandoned that beautiful body forever. I could not deny myself the last sad, sweet pleasure of imprinting a kiss upon the dead lips of her who had been my only love. Oh, miracle. A faint breath mingled itself with my breath, and the mouth of Claremont responded to the passionate pressure of mine. She uttered a long sigh, and uncrossing her arms, passed them around my neck with a look of ineffable delight. Ah, it is thou, Romuald, she murmured. I waited so long for thee that I am dead. But we are now betrothed. I can see thee and visit thee. I love thee. We shall soon meet again. Her head fell back, but her arms yet encircled me. A furious whirlwind suddenly burst in the window. The lamp was extinguished, and I fell insensible upon the bosom of the beautiful, dead. When I came to myself again, I was lying on the bed in my little room at the presbytery. I found the Abbe Serapion in my room. At the first glance, he divined my interior trouble, and I hated him for his clairvoyance. At last, he said, the great courtesan Claremont died a few days ago. There have always been very strange stories told of this Claremont, and all her lovers came to a violent or miserable end. They used to say that she was a ghoul, a female vampire, May God watch over you, Romuald. I did not see him again at that time. I became completely restored to health and resumed my accustomed duties. But one night, I had a strange dream. I had hardly fallen asleep when I heard my bed curtains drawn apart. I recognised Claremond immediately. I have kept thee long in waiting, dear Romuald and it must have seemed to thee that I had forgotten thee. But I come from a far off, very far off. There is neither sun nor moon in that land whence I come. All is but space and shadow. There is neither road nor pathway, no earth for the foot, no air for the wing. And nevertheless, behold me here, for love is stronger than death and must conquer him in the end. Her words were accompanied with the most impassioned caresses, which bewildered my sense and my reason to such an extent that I did not fear to utter a frightful blasphemy for the sake of consoling her and to declare that I loved her as much as God. Her eyes rekindled and shone. In truth, she cried, flinging her beautiful arms around me, since it is so, thou wilt come with me, thou wilt follow me whithersoever I desire. Arise quickly, we have no time to lose. Soon we came where a carriage awaited us. We entered it, and the postilions urged their animals into a mad gallop. I had one arm around Claramond's waist, and her head leaned upon my shoulder, and I felt her bosom half bare, lightly pressing against my arm. I had never known such intense happiness. From that night, my nature seemed in some sort to have become halved, and there were two men within me, 
neither of whom knew the other. At one moment I believed myself a priest who dreamed nightly that he was a gentleman, at another that I was a gentleman who dreamed he was a priest. I could no longer distinguish the dream from the reality. I lived, at least I believed that I lived, in Venice. We dwelt in a great marble palace. I would have been perfectly happy but for a cursed nightmare which recurred every night and in which I believed myself to be a poor village cure practising mortification and penance for my excesses during the day. For some time, the health of Claramond had not been so good as usual. Her complexion grew paler day by day. One morning, I was seated at her bedside. In the act of cutting some fruit... I accidentally inflicted rather a deep gash on my finger. The blood immediately gushed forth in a little purple jet, and a few drops spurted upon Claramond. Her eyes flashed. She sprang upon my wound, which she commenced to suck with an air of unutterable pleasure. When she found that the blood would no longer come, she arose with eyes liquid and brilliant in the most perfect health. I shall not die, I shall not die, she cried, clinging to my neck, half mad with joy. I can love thee yet for a long time. The same evening, when slumber had transported me to my presbytery, I beheld the Abbe Serapion graver and more anxious of aspect than ever. Not content with losing your soul, you now desire also to lose your body. Wretched young man, into how terrible a plight have you fallen. There is but one way by which you can obtain relief from this continual torment. The Abbe Serapion provided himself with a pick, a crowbar and a lantern, and at midnight we wended our way to the cemetery. We came at last upon a great slab, whereupon we deciphered the opening lines of the epitaph, Here lies Claramond. He proceeded to work with the pick. At last he struck the coffin itself, wrenched up the lid, and I beheld Claramond. Her white shroud, one smooth line from her head to her feet. A little crimson drop sparkled like a speck of dew at one corner of her colourless mouth. Serapion burst into fury. Demon, impure courtesan, drinker of blood and gold. He flung holy water upon the corpse, over which he traced the sign of the cross. Poor Claramond had no sooner been touched by the blessed spray than her beautiful body crumbled into dust and became only a shapeless and frightful mass of cinders and half-calcined bones. Behold your mistress, my lord Ramald, cried the inexorable priest. I covered my face with my hands. A vast ruin had taken place within me. I returned to my presbytery, and the noble Lord Ramond, the lover of Claramond, separated himself from the poor priest with whom he had kept such strange company so long. Alas, I have regretted her more than once, and I regret her still. Sleep well, if you can. <laughs>